Hi, good morning, everyone. Um, uh, good to see you again. Are we, re- are we ready for New York? <laughs> yeah, it is going to be, uh, I think, a very interesting um, uh, trip and hopefully very uh, instructive uh, for us all. As we think globally about what insecurity across the African continent actually means. Um, For all of us, we know, particularly those in uniform, um, we are sworn to defend the Constitution and protect territorial integrity, right? But then the question we don't usually explore sufficiently is what constitutes territorial integrity? We generally think about the land when we think about territorial integrity, not necessarily the entire territory, which includes the maritime domain. According to uh, international law, each coastal country could map up to 12 nautical miles out as its territorial waters. Up to 200, there's some debate here, but up to 200 as your exclusive economic zone. So once more, I ask you to ask yourselves the question, if you are thinking strategically about territorial integrity and you have not integrated the maritime component, For some countries, the maritime domain is almost as big as the land domain. So why are we we not more fully seized with maritime security issues if it's that big? That's a concept that a number of people have described as sea blindness. You're blind to the vastness of your maritime domain, for which you also have responsibility as strategic security sector professionals. The history of sea blindness for most African countries goes back to the nature of governance. Governance has always been about ensuring that you are in power, you are entrenched on the land. But then some of you will say, I'm from a landlocked country. Why should this bother me? Why don't the coastal countries and the island nations worry about maritime security? Here's another dimension of sea blindness. Because right now, most, over 70% of what Africa produces, Africa has to trade internationally. So whether you are landlocked or you're by the coast, your goods have to go in ships, and the ships take them for trade. Unlike the 1960s and 1970s, when many African countries were able to feed themselves, now Africa is a net importer of food, net importer of oil, net importer of consumer durables. So as um, Lucas said, quoting um, one of our dear colleague um, Ian Ralby's pet phrases, no shipping, no shopping, in reality, It is no shipping, no eating, no driving, no cooking, no heating. Africa is really, really dependent on its maritime domain. So whether you are a landlocked country or you are a coastal country, the governance of this maritime domain your territorial waters, your exclusive economic zone, the high seas in your vicinity, they impact what goes on. And that's why we think it's an important um, 
thing that we need to um, table for discussion. What is maritime security? Why is it important? And how does it influence um, prospects, security, and prosperity for each African uh, citizen? So Africa's maritime domain is vast, as we have talked about. Um, it has a lot of potential. But if we do not have an understanding of what that potential is, it becomes difficult for us to develop approaches to solve it. Last week, we talked about complex problems, problems that don't just exist in and of themselves, but they influence other factors that make insecurity more uh, difficult. So let's look at uh, maritime security and talk a little bit about some of, some of the issues. There's something called illegal, unregulated, and unreported fishing, IUU, to the technical people. For the non-technical technical people like me, it's basically the theft of fish. Each year, the conservative estimates, each year, Africa as a whole lose, uh, loses an estimated $1.5 billion every year to illegal, unregulated, and unreported fishing. I think, personally, that's an underestimate, given what we know about the price of some of the um, fish in African waters. But it is pretty um, staggering. Think about how many schools, how many roads could be built with that amount. So there is a trade. And let's just look only at fishing. What about the environment? Africa's maritime environment is also unregulated when it comes to um, um, environmental issues. There is a lot of dumping of untreated waste in Africa's maritime zone. There is also the commercial dumping of toxic waste. There are oil spills. In 2006, there was an incident in um, Abidjan, Côte d'Ivoire, where the dumping of um, toxic waste led to 15 people dying and 108,000 people being affected. And, that, and this happens repeatedly across the continent. You look at the Niger Delta. The cost of addressing environmental pollution in one part of the Niger, Niger Delta, that's just the part operated by Shell, according to the United Nations Environmental Program, is going to cost $10 billion and 10 years to fix. That's how seriously the environmental um, damage has affected the economy. And I can go on and on. What does this mean? This means for food, for tourism, for um, transportation, that potential we talked about is diminished. Because of this, what about maritime crime? We see a lot of maritime crime across the African continent, um, whether it is smuggling, whether it is trafficking, whether it is just straight up oil theft, affectionately known in the Niger Delta as bunkering. It's not only the cost is not only what it is depriving the countries of benefiting. The cost is also the cost of trade. Because whenever maritime insecurity becomes a problem in a region, the insurance companies charge the shippers more. And guess what happens to those charges? It gets passed on to the consumer. Whether it is for the exports, the producers suffer, or the imports, the consumers suffer, for the net 
effect is on the African continent. This is why it, this, and I could, you know, talk about a number of other related issues, but I hope you're getting a sense of a maritime environment that is vibrant, has immense potential, but because our notions of territorial integrity does not extend out into the sea, for the most part, we have ignored it. So we have sea blindness, and we also have wealth blindness. Most people say, oh, how are we going to pay for all of these things if we want to do maritime security properly? And I say just stop being blind to the wealth. The maritime um, environment could pay for itself. This is um, a, a map showing um, the, maritime, zone, the marita maritime traffic around the world. And you can see Africa is right in the middle of it. And so seaborne sea trade is critical to economies, critical to um, the um, governance, and critical, I think, to the survival of most African countries. Maritime crime is not the same everywhere. What I have here are two slides. Um, one showing the um, piracy in the Horn of Africa and the other showing attacks on vessels in West Africa. There is a lot of analysis you can do of these two, um, these two um, charts, but the one on the left shows how piracy started close to the coast of Somalia and then grew out as far as the Indian Ocean over a five-year period. The type of maritime insecurity in the Horn of Africa is completely different to the Gulf of Guinea. The Gulf of Guinea, most of the attacks happen when the vessels are anchored or near to port, and it's mainly boarding and theft either theft of goods or theft of the ship or hijacking for ransom. So they're different. What is the, the point here? The point is, when you think about maritime crime, it is not a monolith. It's not the same everywhere. So when we think about maritime strategy, it also has to adapt and evolve as the threats um, change. And so this calls for us to think back to last week. A lot of the points we made about evolving and dynamic, um, and, and dynamic appro approaches to strategy and leadership we would apply, I think, even more in the maritime domain because of the um, dynamism of the, of the challenge. Um, uh, quite often, particularly when it comes to maritime security, we tend to um, harken back to what we, what African countries inherited from colonial rule, the legacies. If the colonial power had a navy, we also need a navy. And what's a navy for? A navy is for the high seas. The Navy is for outside the territorial waters. And in many cases, what we need to be protecting is in our territorial waters. We need something more like a Coast Guard, not just in terms of structure, but also in terms of material. And so let us think beyond a lot of the um, legacies. And let us think also beyond find, having patrons because whether the patrons come from the east or the west, the north and the south, they'll be bringing what they have, not necessarily what you need. I always have this slide because I can't tell you how many African countries I have gone to, visited naval facilities, and see vessels that have not sailed since they were donated to the country. And there's one that um, I always point out, and this is an extreme example, but there was one in which the person who was taking care of this naval vessel 
that had never sailed in about two, three years because they didn't have spare parts or fuel. They were raising chickens on the vessel. They're putting it to some use, yes, but then you ask yourself, what do we actually need versus what is somebody offering Africa? All right, let me just very quickly talk a little bit about some of the elements of um, strategy um, here. And um, we've talked about a lot, of, a lot of the challenges, but the good news is when it comes to strategy and strategic approaches, Africa is actually ahead of most other regions when it comes to, ma to maritime security. How many people have heard of AIMS 2050? AIMS 2050, the African Integrated Maritime Strategy. Okay, the Africa Union actually has a continental strategy. And I encourage you to Google it and read it. Because even though it is very aspirational, it does identify a broad swathe of maritime security challenges that we should be aware of. It also, try, it also has a vision statement that is, I think, consistent with a lot of what we have been discussing here. It's a strategy plus an action plan that hopefully would either address or mitigate a lot of the maritime security threats or challenges Africa is facing between now and 2050. And it focuses on two, the, 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 the vision focuses on two main things. One is sustainable development, and the second is competitiveness. Um, uh, the strategy is, um, as I said, aspirational. It is continent-wide. It's supposed to link to sub-regional strategies. And in some sub-regions, sub we really do have um, very robust um, efforts in this area. But on the negative side, um, the resources to make this happen have not been provided. Um, the institutional mechanisms within the African Union and the regional organizations need to be strengthened. But what we're seeing is within most of the regional organizations, particularly um, in the Gulf of Guinea, also in the Indian Ocean, we see a lot of forward-leaning initiatives like the coordination centers in Seychelles, Madagascar, like the um, coordination mechanisms in West Africa, in the various zones in West Africa. These have not waited for AIMS 2050 to come do it for them. They have started already. And so there's a lot that is always, already going on sub-regionally. And the, and, and the beauty is that it is tying and linking maritime security professionals in the sub-regions so that they could address a lot of the maritime crime issues in a coordinated manner. And particularly in terms of information flows, also they're thinking a lot about um, shared assets and uh, shared capacity and a lot of the... Um, a lot, a lot of the issues that would make for more effective regional um, approaches. But much more needs to be done at the national level as well. The means to do this, we require a lot more political will. We, we require resources to be identified. We also we require the intellectual capacity, not just to think about strategies, but to be able to implement them. The grand aim of AIMS 2050, forgive the pun, is to create a combined exclusive maritime zone of Africa, SEMSA, which would allow for a lot more trade, travel, tourism, 
and in a way that ensures that the maritime um, uh, environment remains um, resilient and also remains uh, relevant to Africa's development prospects. Um, within this context, African countries should think one about the political will. And my, uh, my, my, th my thought is the biggest argument for political will is that if we could manage the maritime environment responsibly, it could pay for itself. There is enough fish, tourism, tariffs from, um, from um, shipping that would be able to um, pay for itself. Um, secondly, from an operational dimension, we have a lot that we could learn from what's currently going on in the Indian Ocean. I mentioned Seychelles and uh, Madagascar. They have found a very efficient way of sharing information and ensuring that all the countries in the region have access to not just um, locally sourced, but globally sourced um, information trends. And this has a really positive impact on maritime domain awareness, and so that they could know who happened to be in their territorial waters, what they're doing, and if they're identified as a negative impact, i.e. trafficking, um, polluting, or stealing, there are mechanisms not just to apprehend them, but there's all the, oh, they also have regional judicial arrangements, so you could try, prosecute, and sanction um, wrongdoers internationally. Um, I talked a bit about the resource and dimension, etc. But let me close by just um, highlighting the importance of um, regional codes. In West Africa, we have the um, Yaoundé Declaration, which was signed in 2013, um, which is not only a coordinating mechanism, it also sets regional norms for what is acceptable and not acceptable in the um, maritime um, environment in West Africa. In the East, you had the Djibouti Code of Conduct, initially um, signed in 2009 when piracy was a big issue. But by 2013, by 2017, sorry, it became clear that you know, piracy is only one of many issues. So they had what they call the Jeddah Amendment in 2017, which, we, which went beyond piracy to look at environmental, to look at um, transnational crime dimensions of maritime insecurity. Um, and as I said, Africa is ahead of many other regions because it already has some of these coordinating mechanisms. The issue then becomes, how do we go beyond the small maritime security communities, so maritime security becomes a national and continental priority. Because as far as when it comes to territorial integrity, I think it is as important as ensuring effective governance and security on the land. And so all is not lost. Um, there is a lot of challenges, but I think there are immense opportunities and most African countries are moving in the right direction in, in, in this regard. And hopefully very, very soon we'll see a lot more work and a lot more effort and attention being paid to maritime security in Africa. Thank you.